Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's at the end of the conference. Thank you for uh, having the graciousness to come and listen to me for half an hour. Um, my name is Grant Likely. I am a, a, I'm a Linux engineer working for ARM in the open source office system architecture team. Um, and so in system architecture, I end up looking at a lot of different areas of the technology of what we need out of the ecosystem. And one particular area that I end up spending a lot of time looking at is boot. So, I mean, today I want to talk about uh, UEFI Secure Boot on U-Boot, which I imagine a lot of people saw that title and went, what is this, UEFI, U-Boot, these are two very different things. So this is something that is going to actually make, when we're doing embedded systems, is going to remove a lot of the variability and um, problems that we have in embedded that is it's going to become important over the next uh, few years for embedded systems. So I just want to go, through, go over what this is. Now, since I'm talking about UEFI, what I've discovered is I have to, most of the time I have to start with, um, with some level setting. So it's just some basic understanding of the terminology and what it is that we're talking about. Because we've got two very different ecosystems when, it talk, when we talk about firmware. We've got what we've done in the embedded space with U-Boot and or other bootloaders as similar that we've got our own process, ways that we've got the project set up, the way that we boot things, the way that we get into Linux and all of that. And then there's the PC world. And the PC world had BIOS, and then that gave way to UEFI, which was in, uh, or EFI, which then became UEFI as an open standard. Um, but they've got, there's a different set of practices that go along with that. Now, in what we're, what, in terms of architecture, there's actually a whole lot of value in trying to kind of bring those two worlds together. And there's been a lot of work done in, on, that, on that in particular over the last few years. But I need to define some things. So first of all, when I talk about UEFI, it's really important to know that UEFI is not a firmware project. It is not an implementation. It is not what is running on your laptops. UEFI is a specification. Right? It defines ABIs and behaviors for firmware. That's it. Most of the time when you say someone's, you know, I'm running UEFI, what they're usually talking about is they're talking about Tianocore or EDK2. And if you can go, you can go onto the Tianocore project uh, website on, on GitHub, and you can find the UEFI reference implementation called Tianocore. And that's most of the firmware on PCs, that's derived in some way from the Tianocore project. And as UEFI has been brought up on things like ARM servers, we've used the Tianocore project to bring that up because it is a full, complete implementation of the UEFI specification, and it has all of the same characteristics as on the x86 world. As, so on the ARM world, we've, we've just bring all those things over. However, as it's only a specification, it's not the only implementation. There are other implementations that are not related to Tianocore. Uh, I don't think any of them are high profile at all, and I don't think they're not worth talking about here. But U-Boot actually happens to be yet another UEFI implementation. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, and this, this is something that first got merged into U-Boot a couple of years ago, uh, and it's actually in quite active use. So it's also, I'll, we'll come back to some of that, but I should also talk about why we're even talking about UEFI for the embedded world. Um, what I find, every, most conversations I have about embedded Linux, especially when we're talking about bring up, has some form of bringing up, get, getting a different, each ARM platform booted is hard. Every single one of the, every, every single embedded platform, not just ARM, Using U-Boot, there's always little variants. There's little, the scripts are slightly different. You need to do something special to get it to boot. You need to have the, the right bits and, bits and pieces. Um, because what, what UEFI does, because it's a specification, it actually goes ahead and defines specific behaviors in a particular way of this is, this is one, the way to, to go through the boot scenario not because it is the one true way to do things, but because it is by agreeing on a common way of booting the system, it means we've got interoperability between, between platforms. In embedded, we haven't had the economic drivers to do that, right? We go to do a product, you bring up a board, you do the things that you need to, uh, to run on that board. 
but it becomes painful for anyone who is trying to support more than one thing. So if you go and talk to Linux distributions, they will be the first ones to bring up that it is not viable for them to support a large number of embedded uh, single board computers because they have to produce a different image for every single one. So what UEFI does is it actually brings a set of standards that are already written, and it's a set of standards that we already have all the code that works with that in the, in the Linux space uh, so that you're able to build an image, distros are able to build images that are supported by firmware from a, with a very diverse set of uh, platforms. Um, it means we've got the same, we can actually adopt the same boot flow on an embedded and the server market with very little cost to ourselves because all this code is already written. Um, it gives us more functionality. Right? The, the one thing is the boot process, but another thing that UEFI brings to the table is it defines a set of APIs for services so that if you need to go and do something custom, or if you need to write a little bit of pre-boot code, or you just want to display a nice graphical menu, there is an API and there's a runtime available that allows you to write an application that is portable and will run on any compliant UEFI, uh, UEFI firmware. And then the firmware is able to provide hooks into all the drivers that it already has. For instance, into the network stack or the, uh, the driver <clears throat> or the storage stack. The OSs, of course, love this because that means they can just do a single image. Uh, they don't, the end users, this is good for the end users. And when I say end users in embedded, I'm talking about the people who are going from the next stage of, I've got a platform that boots Linux, now I need to get my application stack up and running on it. You're, it's able to abstract a lot of the device specific details that we've, um, uh, that previously you've needed to know, such as, you know, what's your flash partition map? By having a spec and a set of agreements on how to do this, we can sidestep a lot of those things, and it means that when we're bringing up embedded products, we don't need to spend as much time doing this fiddly bits. Now, we've already known this in the U-Boot community, right? We've already, if you go and look at the history, there's things like DistroBoot, and DistroBoot was already steps down this path, because what DistroBoot did is the same thing, as it said, let's have common behavior, and DistroBoot, went and it looked on disk and it would load the same configuration file that's used by Grub so that we can make the same, same decisions and distros can still update. This is the next steps down that road. Rather than just trying to emulate or trying to be somewhat compatible, by implementing UEFI, we can be actually compatible and actually use the same processes. So what does UEFI bring? Um, it does a number of things. First thing it does is it defines an executable format and an API. So the, the executable format, it's not rocket science. It's PECOF is the format. Why PECOF? Well, that was the, what was uh, chosen early on. Um, it does the job. It brings a standard API so that when you have a UEFI binary or an application that runs on UEFI, uh, you've got access to environmental variables. You've got access to storage. You've direct access to storage. You've also got access to file systems. You've got access to network services and IP stack and IP. Uh, um, and services like iPixie. Um, applications can then be portable and don't need any knowledge of hardware. Um, and so this all, and you know, we've got that place where we can run bare metal applications, whether it be you want to display a menu or one of the examples that came up is a set-top box. And a set-top box that's, own, that's managed by a network operator might need as part of its boot flow that when it comes up, it needs to go and run a little bit of code to do I need to do some policy updates on my box? And so it can do that in the pre-boot environment and know whether it needs to go out to the network to fetch a new kernel or a fail-safe kernel before then jumping back into the normal boot flow. And the UEFI ABI, because it's standard, it has all the hooks that are needed to go and do that. Um, Oh, I'll, I'll come back to runtime services on that because I want to say one more thing on this. All of the things that I've talked about here, again, are not new. U-Boot already has all the drivers for, for, for file systems. It's already got the drivers for networking applications. What it does do, though, is it wires it in in a common ABI, and that's the, that's the only difference. So if you go and you take a look at the difference between U-Boot without UEFI 
And uh, with Hueyify, the delta in, codes, in uh, binary size is actually very small. Uh, which I had intended to go and get that calculation just before this presentation and then forgot, so I apologize for that. Uh, but you can ask me about that later. The other thing that uh, UEFI uh, defines, which is probably the most controversial part of, um, of UEFI, particularly for those of us in the, in the Linux space, is UEFI defines an API for runtime services. Right? So, I mean, the primary job of firmware, of course, is we want to get into the operating system. Run to, boot time services are great when you want to run that bare metal application, but really our goal is, is we want to get over to the OS. Once we're in the OS, especially those of us, you know, Linux developers, we want control over the box. We want control over the entire exception level that Linux runs at. And UEFI comes along and it says, hey, I've got some code that you can run while the OS is running. And immediately as kernel engineer, uh, the kernel engineers go, yeah, we don't want firmware still running and possibly doing naughty things to memory while, while our kernel is running. And we've been bitten by that many times before, of firmware going off and doing things that, that we're not happy with. So I'm gonna defend UEFI runtime services for a bit. You, the runtime services that are defined by UEFI is actually quite sensible. So rather than there is a, blob, a block that can go off and run on its own with no control over the operating system, what UEFI does is it creates, a, it puts a set of callbacks into a region of memory, it tells the OS about this region of memory, it gives the OS a hook for the OS to say, here's the memory map to run once you switch over to the virtual memory map. And so that the OS then, if it needs to call into a service for firmware, the OS has, the, has control over the runtime environment of that. And it's able to sandbox it and it's even able to inspect what that code, what that firmware code is doing when it gets called. And the other thing that's sensible about it is it's actually really limited. The only things that are put into runtime services are things that the operating system really actually does need the, the firmware to go off and do for it. Such as, if you want to change the boot flow while you're in the OS, it's a standard API for the OS to go modify this boot variable so that the next time we reboot, it goes and runs a different binary. Or, here's an update to firmware that I've gotten off of the network Capsule update, firmware can take that, firmware can then verify the signature and then apply it or get the system set up to apply that change before the next time around. So it's things that are sensible and it's things that are limited and there's, there's not a danger of UEFI kind of becoming this monster that takes over the system. It is quite constrained and there's a, it quite aggressively tries, to, uh, encourages the firmware implementation to turn things off. Um, and of course, with U-Boot, with mainline U-Boot, I mean, with the U-Boot sensibility, we definitely want to turn all that stuff off. So the implementation that's in U-Boot is doing the right things and not leaving a whole bunch of resident stuff. Um, and also, runtime services are entirely optional. If the operating system says, no, I don't care, I don't want your runtime services, it can just reclaim that memory and go off and do its own thing. It doesn't have to preserve any of that. So in U-Boot, specifically for UEFI, U-Boot uh, has native support for the UEFI ABI and uh, the most important protocols that UEFI defines. Um, it's in mainline. In fact, you can enable it for just about any U-Boot platform. Certainly on ARM 32-bit and 64-bit, uh, I believe x86. I know there's some other platforms, but I wouldn't be able to list them for you. <clears throat> Um, it's OpenSUSE and Fedora, for instance, for all of their single board computer support, they use this, right? They still have to do custom images for each individual board because the firmware, how you actually get firmware onto the board is still a problem. But it's, this is their, um, this is their abstraction layer, right? So you, you get into U-Boot, once it's in U-Boot, then you've got all the mechanism of going to Grub and it can do the regular updates of updating the kernel. So Fedora and OpenSUSE have been a big supporter of this. Uh, there's a project called EBBR, 
which is documenting the standards that are required for distros to boot on embedded systems. Um, and so eBBR is em embedded base boot requirements. And if you're familiar with the ARM server space, it's similar to the SBSA, SBBR standards. And so wherever possible, we use the same interfaces between those two so that we've got one ecosystem of software on both ARM and, or on um, server and embedded. Um, and it implements the runtime services. Right now it's mostly empty stubs, but there's uh, variable services that are, uh, there's some patches to add variable services at runtime by caching, and there's some work being done to actually how do you store, how do you handle storage of, or accessing storage devices when the kernel actually owns them. But I, I don't need to get into too much detail of that. You can ask me about that later. So, demo. This is just proving that this all works. What I did uh, before I came here is I went onto the OpenSUSE website, I downloaded the latest tumbleweed. I, it was the generic image, not targeted at any specific uh, system. This is the image that would boot on basically any ARM server machine. I took mainline um, QMU, uh, actually not mainline QMU, QMU packaged on Debian. Um, I compiled uBoot yesterday, and I just ran it with BIOS is uh, uBoot.bin, and this is it. So you can see the standard uBoot slash screen, and the best thing about this is this demo is incredibly boring. Really, all that happens here is you see the UEFI boot, it goes through the uh, EFI boot sequence, it finds the disk, it finds the boot AA64.EFI binary which, uh, in the EFI boot directory. It runs it, and grub comes up. If I let this fall through, it would boot right into the operating system. I just want to show that grub was actual functional. Loading an NRD, loading kernel, get a few messages from the Linux kernel's EFI stub. Wait about 20 seconds. Will I talk and fill the air with sound while I'm waiting for this to continue? And it's taking longer than when I did it 10 minutes ago. There we go. Right, so I didn't do anything special here. This is just mainline U-boot. I just cloned the tree and built it, and it just worked. Um, and this is, with a, this is with an ARM virtual system, but this is through U-Boot. This is not using Tiano Core or any of the, uh, the stuff that would be used on the server side. Actually, I will stop this so that I don't use all my battery. <clears throat> okay, that's the U-Boot background. So I spent half my time talking just about, uh, just about you. You boot secure boot, which is why you actually came here. So secure boot with, um, I mean, we're all talking about security now, and if you're building an embedded device today, especially anything internet connected, you have to be dealing with your root of trust. Of how do you secure the entire boot flow? And UEFI secure boot is part of that. I'm not gonna talk about securing the entire boot flow here. I'm gonna specifically talk about the secure boot portion. Now, UEFI secure boot, that is a name. That, that is what uh, booting is actually, what secure boot is called in the UEFI specification. And it defines a very small extension to the UEFI spec. What it does is if, when secure boot is enabled is firmware will only run an EFI application if that application is signed by a key that the firmware knows about. Um, it has a hierarchical verification model for delegating trust. I'll get back to that in a moment. Um, and it specifically addresses the firmware, firmware OS boundary. Right? So this is all about, it's UEFI Secure Boot presumes that everything from power on of the machine until UEFI in the normal world starts running, that it is all secure. Uh, once we get to the to U-boot running in the normal world, ready to run the OS, then it's checking for that set, and it will only run, whether it be a boot menu, or a special driver, or some special function, or the Linux kernel itself, it'll only boot ones that are signed. 
Once, it, once firmware then goes and executes that, the trust model also assumes that whatever was loaded also has a trust model, right? So it's this trust model, everything is based on the previous stage has been secure, and so therefore this next stage is secure. Uh, <clears throat> So what is secure, how does SecureBoot do this? First of all, it adds the concept of secure variables. Uh, if you're, I'll talk about variables again in a moment, but um, what UEFI implements is secure variables are variables that you can't just change, like the most, most variables in UEFI were insecure, whereas if you had access to the uh, firmware configuration, you could go and change anything. What secure variables have is that if you're going to update a variable, you have to do it with a payload that is already signed by a key that the, the firmware knows about. And in particular, there's four important keys. There is the DBX, or sorry, the platform key, the key exchange key, DB and DBX. And I'll go through these backwards. So starting with the, because the goal is to verify that your, your applications are signed, um, when, and that when a load image is called on UEFI, what it will then go and do is it will load the image, it will check the signature on the image, uh, and then check if the signature or the, um, or the hash for that image is found in the DB variable. And the DB variable is a, is a database of keys, the keys and hashes. If it finds it in DB, great, you get to run today. Oh, well, almost. Then it goes and checks DBX. If it finds the key or the hash in DBX, well, actually, no, you don't get to run today because the, the DBX is the blacklist, right? So that allows for a mechanism where keys can be added to the firmware that say what is allowed to be run, and then if anything is found to be, uh, found to be compromised, there's a mechanism to actually then revoke keys. And so if any of those things show up again or specific uh, images show up that are vulnerable, we've got, there's a mechanism to then remove that. Right, so DB and DBX controls what boots. Who controls DB and DBX? Well, then we get to the key exchange key. Key exchange key determines who is allowed to actually change the DB and DBX variables. And the key exchange key, this is just another database of keys. Uh, the, presumably the keys in, um, in, the, uh, in the KEK are owned by, owned by vendors or owned by even individuals uh, who are, or companies who are producing software. And you can have multiple keys in there, right? So this allows for delegation of control. If the key, if you have, if your key is in the key exchange key, then you can create and sign updates to DB and DBX and then to control those uh, databases. And then finally, there's the platform key. And the platform key is the owner of the system, right? So the owner of the system, once the platform, if a platform key is set on a secure boot system, that means secure boots and enabled. Platform key verifies that KEK is valid, KEK validates that DB is valid, and DBX is valid, DB and DBX tell you whether or not you can boot the image, right? So it's hierarchical. And what this allows, it allows for delegation of trust. So as a platform vendor, you can say, you know what? I trust Microsoft, Red Hat, and SUSE. And so I'm gonna put their public keys in here. Um, or as a developer, you know, you've got a product, you can say, you know what? I only trust my own key. I have my own key in the KEK. <clears throat> and because it's a vertically integrated product, only those images are what, what will boot, right? Uh, <clears throat> Because this, uh, so, and then this, this policy and the way this works is well-defined, so there's already a whole bunch of tools for actually managing these keys. Uh, and the certificate authorities are already familiar with how to, how to work with this. Right now, the main uh, secure certificate authority that will sign, um, that will sign third parties binaries or sign third, third parties uh, keys is Microsoft. Um, but there's, there isn't the same for embedded systems. There's not the same, you know, you don't have to use the common certificate authority. There's, you can choose which keys you're, uh, you trust. Although this is not, a, this is not a, a talk about the design of the trust model on UEFI Secure Boot. This is just how the, how the interface works. <clears throat> 
However, not everything is quite rosy uh, because it turns out that as UEFI is getting implemented in U-Boot, there's been some impedance mismatch, right? So in U-Boot, I mean, if you've worked on U-Boot, you're familiar with the variable store is an all or nothing thing, right? If you, if you boot the system without any stored variables, you get the default ones. If you change any of them and then save variables, anytime you do save, en save environment, everything gets saved. And there's no concepts of temporary variables or anything like that. It's just, it all gets saved. So it's an all or nothing thing. If you want to revert back to origin, original, you have to kind of nuke the key store or nuke to the variable store and start from scratch. UEFI has a very different set of semantics. Uh, and in fact, UEFI defines several different uh, schemes for dealing with keys. Or just, I keep saying keys, variables, for dealing with variables. It identifies the difference between volatile and non-volatile variables. You know, some variables are intended to be transient, and so they will never go out to storage. However, non-volatile vari variables always go out to storage. In fact, non-volatile variables in UFI, if you change a variable, whether at boot time or runtime, it is expected that that variable will get uh, synced to storage, to persistent storage, immediately before the command returns which is an entirely different model from what's in U-Boot. Uh, we've already talked about secure variables. Uh, if an update is attempted on a secure variable, then firmware has to go and check, make sure that the update has been signed and signed by a key that it trusts. And then runtime and boot time. Every variable has the flag. If it's a, runtime, if it's a boot time variable, then when you make the transition from boot time to runtime, UEFI forgets about those variables. Or when I say forget, it doesn't report any of those variables once you're running the OS. So the OS only has access to variables that are tagged as runtime. <clears throat> the, the, the impedance mismatch between UBoot and UEFI has actually caused a bit, of, uh, a bit of tension on how are we actually going to solve this. So I had hoped when I proposed this talk that we were actually going to have a whole bunch of these things solved. Instead, what I'm coming with is a list of problems that in six months from now, uh, if I, they will be solved. Um, so where we're at right now is there's some patches on the mailing list to implement uh, UEFI variable semantics. Uh, it's gone back and forth between doing a completely separate implementation of variables for UEFI from what's, um, what's done in U-Boot. U-Boot maintainers weren't so keen on that because there's a lot of, there's actually a lot of value. Now, the concept of volatile variables is something that would be valuable to just normal U-boot variables. Um, there is value in, even if you don't have kind of a secure world for storing UEFI variables, those variables you may still want to have by default in the regular environment. Um, there's, active discussion on the mailing list, and hopefully there will be a resolution here in the next, uh, next couple of months. But there is, uh, um, Takahiro Akashi has been the, the prime developer working on this and putting some, some RFCs out there. Uh, I predict what we're gonna see is the UU variable system is going to get adapted to handle some of the UEFI semantics and we'll still have a common variable store. At least that's what I'm hoping for because having a common variable store actually has a whole bunch of advantages because it means from the U-Boot shell, the U-Boot environment, we still can access and manipulate the UEFI environment. Um, turns out that the vast majority of secure boot is really easy, is fairly straightforward to implement. And what I mean by that is it doesn't require access to, to trust zone or to special execution environments or anything like that. Um, firmware is perfectly capable of validating keys in the normal world um, to, you know, if you're updating the DB to test against the KEK, to have the same thing, all that's easy to do. Um, there's no secret stored on the, on the device, right? So the, all, the, the, all the key databases are public keys or hashes of images. So there's, there's nothing secret there. You don't need to, to uh, squirrel it away into the secure world. Um, I'm running out of time here. I need to go quicker. Um, 
it's, yeah, so everything is there. It, you can store stuff in regular storage. So it looks simple. We can just do it in the normal world unless we care about rollback protection. And this is where things get complicated because rollback protection, if you're just verifying the images, that's fine. But what if someone goes and is able to erase your variable store? Or what if someone is able to change or manipulate what actually gets stored on disk? Um, once out of U-Boot, once you're in the OS, you know, the, that OS could actually do whatever it wants with, could potentially do whatever it wants with the key store. So if you care about rollback protection, and that is going to be important, probably important in your security model, you're going to need to have a solution that actually, once you get into the OS, isolates out the, the variable store to protect the secure variables. One of the ways to reduce that is to use a trusted execution environment. Um, where what we could do is delegate secure variable stores to a, a T application. Um, that requires backends to U-Boot storage, uh, but what, and it would require the trusted application to provide an API across the secure, non-secure boundary. Uh, but this is all doable, and we can do this with open source uh, software. In fact, what the proposal that's out there right now, uh, and this is something that um, Lenaro, the Lenaro Edge group is working on, is to, reuse a piece of the Tianocore ecosystem called Standalone MM, which is uh, a binary that runs in the secure world that can do all of the um, <clears throat> secure storage operations. It can do get, get variable, set variable, and handle the storage in a way that is protected from the normal world. Uh, Standalone MM is open source, so it's, it's not like this is a closed source binary. Uh, they're working on getting it running on Opti. Uh, if you're familiar with, you, you can go and search what the Opti um, project is if you're not familiar with it. Uh, so in this model, you still have, with a, on an AR64 system where you've got the secure and non-secure parts of the system, your firmware architecture would look very much like this, where you've got trusted firmware running at EL3, you have uh, in the secure world, you have Opti, and Opti is then running that application, standalone MM, to provide variable services through to U-Boot that's running in EL2, or once Linux is running, be able to provide those same services. So this is, an arch this is one of the ways to solve that. And then there's, you also need to account for where, where you actually store stuff, where the storage is actually kept. Um, and the two most, um, Systems that have dedicated secure storage are the easiest to work with. Because when you've got dedicated secure storage, like the secure flash that I've got over on the secure world side, you can give that to the secure world and say, you know what, the OS is never gonna to touch this. Go, it's yours, use it. And it's not gonna be, you can't access it any other way. But there's a lot of devices that don't have that, especially on embedded. If you're talking about a system with, uh, that has EMMC, well, the operating system owns the MMC, right? You can't go and have firmware writing and manipulating the MMC at runtime. Uh, so if you've got a system like that, there is a rollback protected memory block on EMMC devices, which is perfect. However, you have to coordinate with the operating system or the firmware to schedule write. So when an update happens, you actually have to talk back to U-Boot or U Linux and they get Linux or U-Boot to perform the store for you so that there isn't collisions on transactions out to, out to the device. Anyway, this is the proposal that's out there right now. It's probably going to you know, be refined somewhat before code actually hits. Uh, there are prototype patches out there for the secure storage side. Um, <clears throat> but you know, there's still work to be done. So here's the current state of things. I showed you the UEFI support. It's in really good shape, in fact, Go and play with it. It's ready to use now. It's the, I'm certainly encouraging that's the direction we should be going for, for embedded systems. It brings a bunch of functionality that you can use right now, and it's only going to get better. Secure Boot is not quite so happy yet. There are prototype Secure Boot patches, but I haven't been able to find a recent posting of that, mostly because a lot of the debate about variable architecture and you know, the RSA library, where that comes from, has overshadowed the secure boot work. But the, that code does exist, and I would expect to see that in the next couple of months hit the mailing list again. Um, 
I mentioned Lenaro Edge. Ledge is working on the, the model that I just showed there. And I'm just going to leave it at that. I hope I've got enough time for questions here. I don't think I do, but I'm going to ask anyway. Questions? Yes. So the question is, how does uh, how how does UEFI work? Like a yeah. uh, U-boot implementation of UEFI, how does that work with um, with licensing? Yeah. Um, I don't think there's any problem there, right? So it's 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 GPL, right? right? U-boot is GPL. UEFI is a specification, free to implement. The, okay, so the, there, is, there is an agreement. If you're worried about it, go sign the agreement. Right, go read that agreement. It is very, very lightweight. It is very lightweight. Um, most, I wouldn't, okay. I won't give legal advice. <laughs> go to read it, decide for yourself whether or not you're comfortable. The UVU project is evidently comfortable. I'll take one more question and then I gotta get off the stage. Okay, so. What, what are the um, so you're saying you, you would already implement secure boot. No, no, I'm saying you need to implement it as a separate GPU implementation. So that's the next stage of app. And then there is the idea of implementing secure boot. So, have you already part of UBoot? But how do you present the specific UBoot? How is U-Boot Secure Boot different from UEFI Secure Boot? Okay, so UEFI Secure Boot is a very specific thing. UEFI Secure Boot is defined in the spec. When I say UEFI Secure Boot, that's a name. That's a name for something that's in the specification, right? So when I say UEFI Secure Boot, you look at the spec and that tells you what it means. The Secure Boot that's implemented in U-Boot the, old, the, the other, that's not UEFI Secure Boot, that's a different scheme for verifying signatures, right? So it's just a different scheme, right? So verifying a UEFI binary is different from verifying a U-Boot signed binary, right? Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, just I'll, I'll wait outside the room.